today I want to cover what the Responsible Conduct of Research is, or RCR as we refer to it. Uh, what, what is it? What, is it the same as research ethics, that kind of thing? Um, and, and go over some of the specific content that's required training uh, for students, postdocs, uh, other researchers, uh, early career faculty that are supported by federal grants such as the National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, and the USDA's uh, NIFA grants. Yeah, it's just bottom line from all this is if you witness research misconduct, what do you do? You have, do you have a responsibility to report? Uh, what is the plight of a whistleblower, someone that actually does report a case of misconduct? Uh, famous people, as I like to refer to them, from the Office of Research Integrity. And uh, what is the University of New Mexico's response? How, how is UNM responding to the requirements for the responsible conduct of research? So when most people think of morals and ethics, uh, they think of right or wrong or good or bad. You think of the golden rule or the Hippocratic Oath, you know, the do unto others as you would have them do unto you or do no harm first. Ethics are a norm of conduct that distinguishes acceptable from unacceptable behavior. Uh, ethical norms seem sa second nature to you. I mean, they're common sense, right? And um, you don't really see a reason why someone has to tell you what, what is right and wrong. Well, we're not. What we're talking about is we're balancing these, these norms are balanced differently for, uh, in light of our own values and our own life experience. So learning these norms of just research uh, actually provides you a standard which you can then refer to for your whole career as a scientist or a researcher. And the reasons to be ethical include things like, um, you know, the aims of research are for knowledge or for truth, that kind of thing. But also uh, uh, strengthens collaboration. You want to make sure that you're working with someone that's not a phony, for instance. Uh, we are accountable to the public, and the public uh, supports us by, by different methods of funding. And then finally, for the health and safety of the human participants and animals that are used in research, it's important that you're aware of what's, what's, you're, you're, what's expected of you. So the specific content is required for the training of students and postdocs and early career faculty. Uh, and again, like I said, these are NSF and NIH and the USDA requirements. So research misconduct means fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism in proposing or performing or reviewing research or in reporting research results. This is the, the CFR or the Code of Federal Regulations 42. Because of the increasing occurrence of misconduct, especially uh, plagiarism, federal funding agencies are requiring ethics training. Uh, misconduct is also expensive. It's about $500,000 for an institution just to start an investigation. So that, that sort of money these days is, is not, not something we, we waste. But also misconduct hurts people. Um, one, uh, a number from Authenticate, which is a, a anti-plagiarism company that, that markets plagiarism software and the ability to check your own, your own um, grants or manuscripts for plagiarism, was over 70,501 patients treated by 851 retracted studies. So a retracted study is, a re is research that was published, uh, but then found to be wrong and pulled from the official literature. So sometimes too late. Think of that if you're being treated by, by a study that's been retracted. If you witness research misconduct, what do you do? Well, there's three broad areas of behaviors that, that we we're talking about in the responsible conduct research. One is the ideal standard, um, normative ethics, the responsible conduct research. That's what we expect everyone to be up to. Uh, there's also the other end, which is the deliberate misconduct, which I just identified as um, plagiarism, fabrication, and falsification. But then in, in somewhere in between, there's the questionable research practices. Uh, and those questionable research practices may be removing a data point that doesn't seem to fit, or uh, Authorship that is inappropriate to the to the study, and self reports bring the bring questionable research practices up to closer to fifteen to fifty percent, as high as fifty percent. Bottom line here is if you see something, say something. UNM has a process in, pl in place through uh, our policy E40, uh, which de details the process to report. 
and I'll talk more about whistleblowing, but you should, you should know, you should have evidence of wrongdoing and know who to take the complaint to. UNM uh, uh, has the office of the vice president for research, and that is the ultimate place where research misconduct cases are investigated. Now, AIR, or the Academic Integrity and Research Ethics Office here at Graduate Studies, uh, can listen to any questions uh, that you have and suggest places that you might go for help. Again, when do you speak out? Uh, when do you document an issue? Uh, particularly if there's criminal action involved, if research misconduct has occurred, if there's some physical injury or loss of life, or the facilities are, are threatened. Those are times when you should take, take part and report. Now, uh, let me speak just briefly about whistleblowing. Uh, there's a number of things you can see. There's a necessity, an obligation, consequences, perspective, questions, and documentation, and your role. So what that means is that um, if there's a necessity to speak out, uh, misconduct will only come to light from someone who is in a position that, that's close to a project that sees something. You have an obligation. The National Academy of Sciences in 1995 says you have an obligation, if you've witnessed misconduct, to act. Consequences. Both the whistleblowers and those accused of wrongdoing typically suffer, whether or not the allegations are ultimately sustained. Uh, so that's something to re remember, is that uh, whistleblowers usually um, uh, don't have uh, a pleasant experience. However, it's a necessity. Perspective. To avoid the mistake of an inappropriate allegation, potential whistleblowers should begin by asking questions and seeking the perspective that, that they have within the, the lab or the other resource situation. A whistleblower as well um, is best served by asking questions rather than drawing conclusions. Finally, really, documentation is the most important part. Uh, as with good research, the integrity of an allegation of research misconduct is best served by keeping clear, defensible records of what, is a, what happened and when. Okay, the university response for the responsible conduct of research requirement is uh, the academic integrity and research ethics program that we run here out of graduate studies. Uh, we have the uh, AIR program that helps to provide training in the responsible conduct of research. We also have the professional and academic workshops, or PAW, that goes through graduate studies. And, and the professional and academic workshops are important because they've condensed workshops across all graduate programs and across other programs uh, and, and services that the university provides for graduate students. And you can go to the PAW and select a RCR class that fits your needs best. We also have graduate, uh, graduate studies ombudsperson. So if there's a, a conflict or an issue that you may not be able to resolve, uh, please find the ombudsperson. The Dean of Students is another resource for students that uh, have issues with research misconduct or plagiarism. Um, and again, the Office of the Vice President for Research is responsible for research compliance and houses the RIO, or the Research Integrity Officer, who then is, is the person who manages research misconduct issues. And then a, another resource that you can go to is Authenticate. It's access to online as an online application uh, Authenticate.com, and with your UNM ID, you can submit any program, any proposal, any manuscript, and uh, have it checked for plagiarism. You do it before somebody else does. In other words, before you send your manuscript off to a journal for publication, make sure you know that uh, they will check your, your manuscript for plagiarism, and you've done it before they will. So what would you do? Here's a situation where um, Jane has noticed that Bob uh, is deleting data that doesn't seem to fit. What would you do in this situation? What are some of the issues that uh, would prevent you maybe from stepping in and, and quietly intervening with Bob if something doesn't look right? Think about it for a minute. What are some of the other factors that, that would prevent you from, from uh, either confronting or just, again, just saying, hey, what's going on here? What are you doing? Well, in this next, this next shot, you'll see that Jane decided to gently intervene, and she says, you know, Bob, 
I, I think uh, some data may have been left out of our analysis. Bob looks surprised. What is, what is being discussed here? What would you discuss with someone in your lab if uh, you intervened and said something that didn't look right? Hopefully Bob would say, oh, remember, we're just, you know, making this presentation and we've described what the methods are in our paper and we're just following protocol. Hopefully that's the, that's the response. If you look at this, this third slide here is pie charts of getting involved versus how you felt after you were involved in intervening in a potentially uh, uh, responsible misconduct in a potentially questionable research practice. If you look at this, this left side, the, about a little more than half, 53%, decide to intervene in, in, a, in a part where they are observing some sort of questionable practice. So of that, a little more than half, 53%, um, if you look at the, the right chart, it says about two-thirds had either were satisfied or neither satisfied nor dissatisfied on their intervention on a questionable research practice. So a little more than half got involved, and of that half, about two-thirds uh, felt okay about intervening in, in a questionable research practice that they observed. But look below here. These are all the, quote, catalog of wrongs. The first... Uh, Three bars include research misconduct, falsification, and fabrication, as well as plagiarism. And, and the, the scale at the bottom says there's over 600 instances reported. So maybe getting involved or gently intervening or um, saying something early on after you see something is important and, and will stop uh, an otherwise uh, not just questionable research practice, but perhaps uh, out and out research misconduct. I think your lab would be more healthy and you would feel better having said something. Again, there are some instances where you may not want to say something. Maybe there's a power differential. Uh, it's a senior faculty or a senior postdoc or something that um, uh, may have some uh, poor outcomes for you. But on the other hand, um, it may be important to say something. So how are you supposed to learn all, the, all these practices for the responsible conduct research, or how are you supposed to become an ethical researcher? Well, one thing is you can contact the AIR, the Academic Integrity Research Ethics Program at Graduate Studies, uh, or you can talk to your mentor. Uh, mentoring is one of the more important parts of your experience here at the University of New Mexico as a graduate student. You want to find mentors that um, inform, instruct, and provide examples to trainees, and they establish a long-term interaction with you as a mentee. They want to, you want to have a mentor that creates a safe environment, that embodies trust, provides opportunities and socialization, takes you to a meeting to uh, talk to other researchers about your own project. And they can conduct research that are, uh, that's of interest to you and, and your lab group. Mentees, on the other hand, you, uh, you need to be open-minded and want to learn new things. You want to ask questions to clarify and gain new knowledge and be responsible and also embody trust. And you want to meet your goals and you want to do what you say you're going to do. So in this short module, I've tried to uh, provide you some information about your responsibilities to the responsible conduct of research. Some areas to go if you see something that's not appropriate, whether it's misconduct or uh, questionable research practice or something that you don't know how to respond to. Uh, we have a number of, of resources and there's a lot of information out there about research ethics and research misconduct. We hope you drop by and uh, take some more of these modules and feel comfortable in being able to make ethical decisions as you encounter them down through your graduate career. Thank you very much.